Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> hey, Paul. How's it going? As you know, this is the measure of an episode where it is our continuing mission to explore what makes a Star Trek episode a proper, a genuine Star Trek episode and not just regular TV. I'm Paul. I'm still Jonathan. And we do this using three criteria. Uh, the first is, is there sci-fi required in the plot? Can you, the Would you have to do some major editing and reworking to move this plot to something that was not Star Trek? Uh, additionally... Is the sci-fi presented in a interesting and or unique and or novel way? And the third is, uh, is there a moral or ethical quandary that is being debated? And boy, howdy, they were really subtle in this one about what the, what the moral <laughs> dilemma was, what the ethical dilemma was. Yeah, Picard's like a cranky pants in this whole episode. So I I thought this was a great episode. Like I just season three is just fantastic because they were finally the the reins were taken off. They were allowed to reference previous the they were allowed to reference the original series. They were allowed to reference previous episodes, and they they also had a much better idea of the characters. So like having Picard be such a stickler about the Prime Directive, you know, like I feel like this was where they kind of. We're getting the the handle on on what the characters liked and disliked, and where they stood as far as their their moral and their moral compasses. So I think that's why he was so cranky in this episode. So I'm sorry, Paul. Which episode is it? Please. <laughs> <laughs> this week we watched The Next Generation, season three, episode four. Who watches the Watchers? Uh, and the blurb is: A proto-Vulcan culture worships Captain Picard as if he were a god, and they prepare to offer a sacrifice in his offer. They kind of jump to the end there a little bit yeah. in the blurb. Um, it's not, this is sort of a bad blurb as far as TNG goes. Mm -hmm. um, but to go back to everything that you just said, I think this is a great, I think I agree. Like it's a great culmination of we're in season three. They're starting to reference old stuff and everybody's kind of dialed in with their character to the point where it's, they, you don't feel it as much. You don't feel like this is a new show. This is a seasoned show mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. They knock it out of the park, as the, as you say, and it's and I, I would normally hate these types of episodes where a lot of the episode is in this this prehistoric kind of culture where you, a lot of it is is just this made up culture, ancient culture to, to for the benefit of a plot. Just to jump to the end of our episode, I think it was a a, a almost perfect genuine proper star trek episode yeah no i'd agree with that um yeah and and also a great episode nonetheless like it's 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 just so well i mean everything was seated everything pays off um beverly crusher got a haircut <laughs> everything's great yeah no and this is this is why we love this this is an episode so that shows why next generation is so beloved although there i do have a complaint i do have one complaint about this episode and that is the music I, don't, I i meant to text you to while you were watching it to say pay attention to the music because it opens up and you know i as you know this is the measure of an episode where we're thrust into the plot mm -hmm. we don't we don't have any kind of uh boring mm. conversation as prelude we we are on our way to the plot like the plot yes the plot has started but we are on our way to the plot like the plot has not that's true we're, we're not in the thick of it we i guess we should say we're thrust into crisis that immediately changes afterwards. Oh yeah, where they watch everybody die on screen. I forgot about that part. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so I liked it. The only problem I had it is that it has this weird score. Mm -hmm. It totally that doesn't did. come back. Yeah, and it felt like a horror movie because it's just like ch -ch 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 -ch. <sighs> mm -hmm. it's like what? And I'm like thinking to myself, and especially coupled with the title, which could definitely be the title of a horror movie which is who watches the watchers right i mean that's creepy right. and it's, i was thinking to myself if i didn't know what this was already about or if i didn't already know what this was about those two sentences mean two different things i think i think that it, i would have just expected it to be sort of a voyager-esque plot line where something weird happens or an enterprise-esque hot uh hotline <laughs> called <laughs> enterprise <laughs> 100 enterprise but it wasn't. But just the music was it was signaling something that it ultimately did not become. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Um, and I, I I did notice it in the beginning. It was just it, it was very it was very synthesized as well. Um, yes, yeah, and very repetitive. Yeah. By the way, so I watched it at like one point five speed because uh, we were recording because in we less can. than forty four minutes. <laughs> yeah, and because we can. 
Uh, and, and it just made it even that much more annoying mm-hmm. <laughs> because anyway, uh, yeah. So they get to the planet and we find out that these people are watching, uh, a proto Vulcan society. Like the blurb said, so, so this far was, this tracks. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, that in and of itself is a very interesting thing. If you think about it, because it would be like if we traveled hundreds of light years away and found a proto-human race. Okay. And it, it's never clear that we're close to Vulcan in this. It's just that we're out in the middle of nowhere and there's a planet with a proto-Vulcan race on it mm-hmm. that is somehow isolated from the planet Vulcan, the actual planet Vulcan. And they say proto-Vulcan. So it just – it asks a lot of questions because, okay, so how do they get there? If they are truly Vulcan and they're – very uh, far behind where the actual Vulcans are. Right. So how do they get there? Is this just some like a term they're using to say, well, they're kind of, they're mostly like Vulcans somehow randomly. And they're not actually Vulcans, but they, by some throw of the dice uh, genetically, they randomly, they're very similar to Vulcans. Or are they saying these are Vulcans, but they're just, they're not as advanced as the regular Vulcans that we know of, which they, I feel like they could have gone into had, you know, they didn't have to do the other part of the episode, but that, that I kind of missed. I kind of wanted to know more about that. I don't think it ever comes back. No, it doesn't. Proto-Vulcan. Right. Well, and I, I would, yeah. I, I assume it's because to actually explain that in an episode would be boring as. Sh- <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But, but very science fiction. I, but I, I would, I would guess I would it has argue. more to do with like, just the the biology of the the species that's being developed you know like they probably have copper based blood and that's why they're proto vulcan there is a moment where it gets very dark where okay so the guy the proto vulcan guy falls out of the thing well so no just to, to back it up so the the observation deck um you know he like i i actually genuinely thought like in that cold open that everybody had died and that's what they had just witnessed and <laughs> i i was thinking that this was a really dark episode. I mean, it turns out that they weren't, and they they were able to bring everybody back to the Enterprise and, and fix them. But um, but then I I the the observation deck when it became visible, I thought that that was going to be. I, I didn't expect him to be able to actually get up there and see in the window <laughs> and have Data notice him <laughs> just peering in, <laughs> which is kind of a cool moment. It's kind of a oh, what do we do now? Right. Yeah. Uh, this whole mission has just been flushed down the toilet. <laughs> the right. That, well, yeah, which is, I mean, they just it, saw it us. obviously had to happen because that was what the rest of the episode, you know, they're like, the egg is already smashed. How, how much more smashed do you want it to be? <laughs> right. We cannot put the egg back together, no matter how hard we tell Data to try. <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyway, so, so Dr. Crusher comes climbing down. She climbs out of the electrically charged window somehow. And, <laughs> and climbs down the, the the mountainside to to collect him. Yeah. Yes. So he is injured, and so she says two to beam up and takes him to sick sick bay, and she's working on him. And Picard comes in with a with a cranky face, mm-hmm. and he says, "What are you doing? <laughs> we we talked about this. Who the hell is this?" And guy? she says, <laughs> "You didn't tell me that Spock was on board." <laughs> no. So. So she's he's mad because he's like, "What are you doing? This is the prime directive. We have we have rules uh, against kind of contaminating a, a light." She's like, "No, he 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 is almost dead because of us. I had to do something. You know, he was going to die if I didn't intervene." And he says, "And why didn't you let him die?" Uh-huh. And I was like, "Oh my god, Picard must be a descendant of Jonathan Kent." <laughs> Was that where you thought I was going, or do you think I was going somewhere? Else? No, I. Do you think I was? I I, I didn't oh, expect you to be going obvious. anywhere. No, like. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was a dark moment it was, where he it was, he was yeah. like, no, you it had it had no sympathy, no empathy. He was just you should have let him die. Mm-hmm. End of story. Yeah, I mean, I I would not have surprised me based on his demeanor if he took out his phaser and shot them. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of cleaning up your messes, Beverly. <laughs> Where's Pulaski? I mean, he he said the same thing with the with the cryogenic people as well. You know, he's, he's like, if we hadn't come, they would have right. remained dead. Like, <laughs> you could have left them, and there wouldn't be a problem right now. Data. <laughs> 
Yeah. I, I mean, it, it felt, I mean, it was nice. It was nice to see how much he values the prime directive and it was dark. Like it was, it was not, it didn't feel like nineties television to right. me where no, I would agree. they're saying, Oh, you should, you should definitely let this innocent man die who we are responsible uh, for. Killing. Right. That's how important it is. So there's this conference uh, where all of the, everybody sits down and they talk about uh, what has to happen now. It's a very clear teller scene about setting the stakes. We have a missing human. Mm-hmm. We we have the prime directive. Uh, there's the two. Conf- there's the conflict. We can't just beam them out because because it'll 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 further contaminate their culture. But we have to get them out. We can't just leave them there. And so and they, it just it was so well laid out. They laid out every single problem in a in a convincing and economical way. And that that's another reason why this show seems to reign in, in terms of science fiction and in Star Trek altogether, mm-hmm. that they just are able to hit all those beats without a bunch of crap. Well, and yeah, and without making it very obvious that they are like it's two people coming from the two different positions and they they don't really know where the other person stands until this conversation happens. And, right. you know, and so their their position is very clear, like they're not they're not telling the audience they're telling each other and they're, they're just telling each other in a way that the audience is getting the information at the same time it was great and there wasn't anybody who was coming from a place of ignorance where they had to explain the situation to them right and that's usually the the crutch mm-hmm. they didn't even they didn't use that everybody was on uh, on the same page in terms of where they were and it was it was just great it was wonderful to listen to again with the good writing yeah yeah i mean it was it was a great scene where it's nothing but exposition but it's being done in a way that keeps the audience captivated Right. Yeah. yeah. Therein lies the science fiction. <laughs> no, that's magic. That's magic. It takes writers. <laughs> it, it's a magical thing when when that can happen. I mean, you know, think about like uh, to totally go off topic. Doc Brown and Back to the Future. Almost everything he says is exposition, but he says it in such a captivating right. way that you don't care. Yeah. Yeah. You could. I mean, I I, I understand why Marty hangs out with this guy because <laughs> he could read the phone book and you would want to know what's happening. <laughs> Exactly. So it's the idea is floated uh, off screen that Troy and Riker are going to go down and do some exploration. And they must have beamed down right after either their Sound of Music auditions or their Ricola lozenge auditions. Because they were wearing <laughs> basically what kind of read as Swedish garb. Yeah, and I was I was okay with everything for the outfit except for Riker's shorts and knee-high boots yeah it was very what are those called what is that it's the german outfit lederhosen yeah lederhosen <laughs> that's what it felt like yeah and it just it felt so what's it called ren fair to me it didn't feel like they were blending in because they were they so they they took in in dressing the natives they took more of a native american thing even in the music has had sort of that that native american flute and they all were kind of wearing that sort of dark woven linen looking type of thing. And then <laughs> Ricard, Ricard. Oh, <laughs> what if there was a transporter accident? What what would that guy look like? Ricard. Either completely hairless. <laughs> no, no, no. But below the neck. Yeah, no, he'd be, yeah, he'd be bald with a beard. <laughs> and strangely very short for some reason. <laughs> Riker, I kept on wanting to say Ricard. Riker and Troy just look totally out of place for some reason, and it also implies that there are other villages. Mm-hmm. That it's not just a singular village on this. Which point. was good. Yeah, that was nice. That was nice. Yeah. I don't think they ever do this again, where they kind of have an open channel at all times with the ship that they can kind of just talk into just listen at in. any given time. Yeah. When they, yeah, and they did this thing where they they tweaked the audio where it sounded like an earpiece when whenever the ship would talk back to them. Oh, I missed that. Okay. Yeah. It happens mostly, I think, when they're talking to Troy and she's already being held prisoner. Right. Mm-hmm. It it was so cool. Like, I was just riveted the whole time. And I don't even like these types of episodes. And I was riveted. <laughs> and we do get a little bit of playful back and forth uh, with, between Troy and Riker. Like, there's a little bit of flirty stuff going on with them, which was kind of nice to see. Because we had talked about earlier that, or in, I think the last episode, that they... They had a, a relationship off screen that never really gets culminated in everything mm-hmm, in anything mm-hmm. during the show. They never hook up, but they are they, in this. This is a good example of of them having some chemistry, yeah, and obviously some history, right? Like it, it, 
it was just dialogue. There wasn't anything about their history, but you could tell that they just they they were very comfortable with each other. And yeah, right. and I think you yes. know, and I think that just goes back to it being season three and them like understanding their characters and being in their stride and that kind of thing. Um, so I thought it was kind of cool that this was the first episode where they did the um, they changed their physical appearance to blend in, um, and they acknowledged it in the in the right in the commander's log um, voiceover. And this is so this is the first episode, and apparently every time Riker does this his his missions get botched like we've we've already seen one in <laughs> with the first contact where he goes down and he you know gets injured yeah. um but apparently that's uh that's a recurring theme in all the episodes where he he has to go on a reconnaissance mission like he he screws up in some way and they discover him to be a spy <laughs> yeah how does it keep happening Riker, that this, you know, you keep messing it up. Like, not even little tiny mistakes. Right. Like, culture-changing mistakes <laughs> happen when you go down to these things. She was hot. <laughs> yes, I know, but that can't be the excuse every time. <laughs> Only when it matters. <laughs> Am I right? More like second contact. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, he's just... Still got his high five hanging for Picard, and Picard refuses. He refuses. She was supposed to be my number one. I played the I flute. I called her. Yeah. You can't keep leading with that opener. We got to find something else for you. It's it's killing your game, man. I play the flute right here. I got it from a civilization that died 6,000 years ago, and they lived in my head for a generation. I will, I will tell you the story. Gather around. Gather round. Nobody gather. Nobody. Nobody gathers around. <laughs> the one who stays through the end gets to stay with me. <laughs> gets to see the flute. <laughs> <laughs> they will get to play the flute. <laughs> so how much of that is okay? Stay? So <laughs> oh, it's all of it. all it's staying. Great. Okay, so Riker. They have this fun little scene, action scene, where Riker has to steal the injured whatever you want to call it guy the injured guy human ocampan yeah. um and they take him back uh, so he has to run away with him on his shoulder and apparently that must not have been uh Riker or rather who plays Riker what's his name Jonathan Frakes Jonathan Frakes uh, William T Frakes he has a terrible back and so i can't imagine him carrying a guy all day mm-hmm. uh, in an action scene mm-hmm. like this well yeah and his back was turned the entire time <laughs> exactly so he he hides him. They they have a fun little escape. Although I feel like anytime he rounded a corner, he could have been beamed away. He didn't have to go in this little tiny cubby hole, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> which they set up as as being something that might block sensors. Oh uh, yeah. So it was kind of it was kind of weird for right. me. But they wanted it to be an exciting scene, so I get it. Well, and I I think it's a lot harder to beam while running. Like so, he would have had to stop to beam up, and it would have allowed the person to catch up to him, which is why he finally like I he needed to find true. a place where he could. Settle him down and stop moving to beam him up. Right, and it, it did it did have a lot more uh, function than that as well than just an action scene. Is that they were setting up that they are a bow faring society, not faring, but a bow carrying society. I guess <laughs> that is their main weapon yes. is a bow, which comes into play later. Twice it comes into play. Yeah. Once when Picard is trying to explain to Nuria, uh, sort of lay out the idea that there might be some people who are more advanced than you, that whole explanation, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which was just so well written. Yep. And then later when Picard gets shot in the face with, a, with an arrow. So it, it was setting that up. And so, uh, so Riker is beamed aboard, but Troy is being held prisoner by the, what are they called? Tarlaxians. The Proto-Vulcans. Tar- Tratalaxians. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, hang on. It's I'll, I'll grab it. Hang on. Altanka or something like that. Altanka. That sounds good. Sounds vaguely Native American. Mintakin. Mintakin. Um, and so there, so there is a moment where all of the science fiction in this in this show, not just this episode, this whole show in the world, <laughs> is culminated, where they ha- they want to beam Nuria up to the up to the ship. But they can't do it in front of everybody. But the, but Picard says we have to do it. This is the only, this is the best way to fix this problem that Beverly got us into. <laughs> and so he they, they could have just done it where they wait for her to go to the bathroom or to go outside back to her house and then they beam her up. Right? They could have done it that way. It would have taken five seconds. Problem solved. But they didn't do that. And this is why this is the best show on the planet because they have this sort of covert 
kind of heisty thing where they're talking to Deanna through her earpiece and they're saying, okay, which person are we going to beam up? I can see on my readout, my transporter readout, just a bunch of signatures, but they don't have names because they don't have lapels. Mm -hmm. And that's how you know who's who when you want to beam somebody up. And, and so they're like, okay, which one is she? And, and so she can't talk. And so they're saying, okay, is the one going up the stairs? She's like, no, is the one going over here. Yeah, that's her. And so, and so now they know. And, and it's just, it's such a wonderful little procedural of science fiction. And it was a simple, it was super simple, but they didn't just phone it in by saying, okay, we beamed her up done. Let's, let's move on with the plot. They're like, they took a moment, a couple of minutes and had this little set piece. And I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. And you wouldn't think of it that way because normally in the show, everybody's wearing a lapel piece or they're saying two to beam up. And that's kind of code for, hey, beam me and the person immediately next to me up. Right. right? And so you, they never have this thing where I don't know who's who. Mm -hmm. Who am I beaming up? <laughs> you know? Right. Give me more information. Exactly. And that was that that was them giving them more information. It was great. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody should go watch just that scene. Yeah. Over. Because I don't know. Like it's and it's it's not ostentatious either. If you think about if this scene were to be in one of the new J.J. Abrams movies, that they would have made a 10 minute sequence out of it. And it would have been I mean, it probably would have been brilliant and fun to watch, but it wouldn't have been have so it wouldn't have been so un understated. In in the J.J. Abrams movie, it would have been a uh, chase scene through a crowd, you know? Um, exactly. Two, two to beam yes. up, but wait until I get to him. Are you there now? No, wait, I'm not there yet. No, I've lost him. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. And he would have been like the way they would have got him. They would have pushed her out of a building. It's like okay, you know what I mean. Like that would have been how that the one at terminal velocity. And they beamed her. <laughs> Did you get her? No, that was a super bad move pushing her out of the building. <laughs> Let's not do that next time. On the bright side, we don't have a bad guy anymore. <laughs> okay, so so Nuria. Gets beamed aboard, and they we have that scene where she throws herself to the ground because she sees Picard, and he he says, "I'm Picard," and I feel like in that moment, I understand that eventually you have to explain who you are, but in that moment when you're first meeting her, don't say your name is Picard because then you have to get through all of this "you are God" stuff. But he said, and he, and he kind of pauses. He's like, "I'm Jean Luc." I'm Picard. All right. <laughs> I'm that. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. This happens all the time. <laughs> Uh, no, that's uh, a good point. I didn't even think about that at the time because I, I realized like he was just going through his his spiel. Although he usually says I'm Captain yeah. Jean Luc Picard, right. but yeah, he's I just took him as going through his his regular introduction and then realizing what he was going to say at the end. And he's like, "Well, I started it. I might as well finish it." Um, but you're right. Like if he had just right. left it as Jean Luc, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I know eventually you have to tell her because that's the whole point of bringing her up. There. Mm -hmm. But don't lead with it. Yeah, I really liked how he handled explaining everything to him, uh, to her, and um, he he shows people their world below them. He did it in uh, uh, First Contact. Um, he did it in First Contact. He did it in. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. I knew it. <laughs> um, well, I, I didn't. I didn't realize that was the episode until I was going to getting to it. Um, and he yeah. explains in Insurrection that. Um, that moment for him when he saw his world or like they were orbiting his world below him, like that was when time stood still for him. And it was just an amazing moment of realizing how, how small the world was compared to the universe. Um, and so it was, it's obviously that's taking the pieces from before and finding a way to justify him doing that. But I like that it just gives him more care. Like he, you know, he's like, let me, let me convey this to you in the way it was conveyed to me. Um, because I had such a deep impact with it, you know, I, I assume you will too. Um, yeah. You know, it was, and it does. I, I don't know if she would have intuitively recognized that, that was her planet because th this is, I mean, pre wheel, uh, civilization, I guess for her. And I don't know if she would just immediately snap in. It's like, Oh, this is my planet from above. I don't know if that would be obvious. You're right. I know she's supposed to be super smart, but he would have to say, no, that you're, you're spinning. You know, I, she would have said, well, I didn't know that my, my, my planet does not move. And he would say, no, it does. <laughs> and I was like, we can't get into that right now. Though. <laughs> <laughs> they just keep like going back to those scenes. And he's like, so this yeah. is rotation and this is revolution. Yeah. And <laughs> your world spins on what's called a tilted axis. And that is how you have night and day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there would be so many questions, right? There, you would just there would be an endless amount of questions that you could never answer. Yeah. And I guess that's 
they 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 got to a certain point and then like okay she's now not going to ask any more questions <laughs> because <laughs> you would just have a million questions and just speaking to that like i just i loved that moment where you know he 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 feels so proud of himself you know he's like i avoided all of this we we don't have to have the the prime directive violated and all that kind of thing and then she's like so i just have one more question like <laughs> can you bring these people back to life please <laughs> and he's like uh all of this wasted <laughs> i know pulls out a phaser it's true I mean, he did such a good job too yeah right he did i mean it's such a well-written scene and it's so well acted mm-hmm. that you just you're on board it's like who could not who who would not understand this this problem right or this i guess this concept of if you know we're not the end-all be-all of advancement that there would be people if, if people can advance there would be people who would, may have advanced beyond yeah. us. so he's sitting there frustrated <laughs> And he's like, ah, I wish somebody on this ship would just die so I could show her. <laughs> I, it was unclear if, you know, Picard pulled Beverly aside and been like, <laughs> listen, uh, I'm trying to make a point here. <laughs> she's not, she's not getting into it. So, uh, you know, if, if we could just have you know an saying. accident in sick bay, that'd be great. <laughs> Pick the oldest one. <laughs> Give him a yeah, shot. I mean, of I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Puro or whatever it was called. <laughs> Ripo, ripo. So, so the patient in that scene where the old lady is dying on the scene, it's funny because it starts with her and it starts with the old man kind of leaning over her and she's like writhing or having some sort of seizure mm-hmm, or something mm-hmm. terrible is happening. And then it pans back and the main doctor of the ship is just standing there being like, I don't think she's going to make it. Right. It's like, well, if you just keep standing there, she's, you're probably <laughs> right. Doctor, how could you be certain? Can you stand back just a little bit longer? Then we'll know for sure if she's going to make it. <laughs> Uh, this is Pulaski's fault. Did you notice that she kind of gives a little, throws a little shade at Pulaski? Polanski? Pulaski. No. No in. Roman, Roman Polanski. Uh, Deanna, Diana, Pulaski. Is, was it Diana? I think it was Diana. Oh. It's just interesting that they would go with no, Diana Pulaski and Deanna Troy. And Deanna Troy. Yeah. It's a bad mistake. That's why she got fired. Probably. That, that's probably the reason. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way around this. We wrote ourselves into a corner. Um, no. What was her name? Sure, it wasn't Diane. No, couldn't have been. You're right. I, I, this is why people listen to this podcast right. for moments like this, <laughs> where it is easily Googleable, but we don't do it. <laughs> we try and we try and pull it out of ourselves, and we're not going to give you the right answer, listeners. Oh no, we're not. You're going to have to Google it. No, we're not. Do you I have do. it? Okay, what is it? No, let's leave it. <laughs> oh, how tantric of you. Maybe we'll give it to you, listeners, in the next episode. <laughs> you have to keep listening. <laughs> what is Pulaski's first name? <laughs> What's funny is this is this is actually the last time she's uh, she's mentioned in the series uh, TNG. Interesting. And she oh. she is only mentioned one other time, and that's in the series finale of Voyager. Um, Doctor Catherine Pulaski is uh, paged. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Is that something that I should have caught on to, or is it in the background type? Of it's in the background. You have to be a nerd. Yeah. Know. I mean, it like it, it's in an overhead, you know, a, a PA announcement, but okay. it's not part of the main conversation. So if you're, if you're focused solely on the conversation, you would miss it. But if you were listening to the ambient sound around them, you would hear it. So it's not like you like it's not okay. on the screen sideways, upside down. And if you turn it, you know, what a weird pull. Right. I mean, what of all the different references you could make to TNG? Oh, right. You do Kat, Catherine Pulaski. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess it could be a, you know, you're in a hospital, so naturally she would be there and and also naturally she would be 192 years old doesn't voyager take place like well after tng no it doesn't is it concurrent or oh it is it is because troy is actually in the show troy's in the show right. broccoli's okay. in I'm the show wrong. um it starts on ds9 you're right you're right i'm wrong about everything <laughs> just on the podcast paul <laughs> But this is also why listeners come to our podcast. It's for moments like this. Yes. When I have no information to give. <laughs> and you exasperatedly give it to well, me. Well, all right. So Crusher is blaming Pulaski. Yeah. And I guarantee that the the procedure, she uses Pulaski's procedure. She's like, I'm familiar with Pulaski's procedure. Right. She's kind of, I, I guarantee that the reason it doesn't work is because Crusher could not bring herself to let her be right one more time. The procedure is actually something that happened in season two. Like that's what makes season three so great. It just has these little references where you didn't need to see the episode to know what they're talking about. But if you did, it just makes it so much greater. Like if you watch season two, you would know that Pulaski was able to wipe someone's short term memory. Right. Do you remember which episode? I don't. I feel like we've seen a little bit of Pulaski. Pulaski? What what is her last name, Paul? (laughs) 
Plutoski. <laughs> I feel like it's not it's it's not feeling right in my in my mouth. Chipotle. <laughs> Their guac is excellent. <laughs> That's actually a Jack in the Box reference. Chipotle. 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 Gracias. Hasta luego. Gracias. Lo, 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 lo. Just go. So it comes down that Picard, he beams down in his in his uniform and says. I am just flesh and blood. He has basically the same scene he has. With well, yeah, like he, he just convinced her that he was human. And he's like, okay, now that you're convinced, I'll go down. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it would have worked if he had just convinced her and then sends her back and says, no, I've been there. You know, it's, it's all real. Uh, okay. I don't think that would have right. worked. He had to go okay. down. He had to go. And, and the guy had to shoot him. Well, but he said, if you shoot me, you will kill me. He shot him. And then he comes. And he did not kill Right. <laughs> You're totally right. He says, you will kill me if you shoot me. But uh, although he doesn't technically shoot him, right? He accidentally, the arrow accidentally hits him after somebody tries to tackle what's his, Ray Wallace. Oh, no. I, I thought that the tackle was what kept him from not dying. Like, I thought that for sure he was going to shoot. But because... he, But yeah, regardless of, of what the intention was, the reason Picard doesn't die is because he was tackled right. while shooting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we handled it. Yeah. It's a flawless episode. Well, so uh, again, like season three is just one of the best seasons, but you have to get through seasons one and two to, to really appreciate it. Um, but he's given this Mintakan tapestry and it shows up for the rest of the series and it shows up in every movie except Insurrection or Nemesis. That's great. Yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. Does it show up in Generations? Uh, I, I read the trivia that it shows up in remember. every Next Generation movie except nemesis except nemesis but then it said it shows up in first contact and insurrection and i was like okay so is generations not a next generation movie people tend to forget about that movie a little bit yeah it's that kind of thing like i feel like more shows should do where you can show that it's serial while still being episodic and you don't have to pay like it's just room decoration if you if you saw the episode you would go oh he still has that tapestry how cool if you never saw the episode it would just be part of his regular furnishings in his room yeah it wouldn't matter yeah it's cool yeah and that's what's great about these types of shows where they're really good and so they have all of these elements that that you can reference that are referencing really good episodes and they're smart enough to sort of have it on their wall they're in in a sense gaining more flair <laughs> right <you know? laughs> it's the it, it it's the Applebee's flare on their vest, right? Or whatever, the Chili's flare. Yeah. Doesn't, it doesn't feel like it on the surface, kind of like Best of Both Worlds does, mm-hmm. where it's just this epic thing that happens. But it, it is truly one of those just wonderful episodes that it, it it's a perfect example of all the things that we like about Next Gen. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Third, yeah. third season is just and a great just season. Ends. Yeah, and then just ends. Yeah, it just, it, <laughs> just ends. It just ends. <laughs> we have a handshake. I mean, really, the implications of something like that happening where, okay, so only this village has witnessed this event. Mm -hmm. So obviously it would leak out. You know, there's no agreement that the villagers have. It's like, okay, we can't tell people about this. This is this is for us. You know, maybe we can talk about it for now. But if we start telling people, they're going to think that we're crazy and they're just going to come and loot our village. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we can't tell anybody, but it would obviously leak and it would the the contamination would spread. And uh, it, they will never be the same again. They might as well pack up all of their stuff and leave Starfleet because they're no longer observing a a virgin civilization. Well, I think they said that, especially after Riker left. I thought I thought that's what they were saying. Like they were they weren't going to observe anymore. Well, they couldn't. It wouldn't it wouldn't make any sense. They would not. It, the The experiment was contaminated. Right. Well, and I mean, they might have also been saying we're not going to observe anymore. You know, wink, wink, type thing. Like we just have right. to. Have yeah, them but, believe we're not going to, so we can try and you know get back to uncontaminated. Right, and they and Picard does say something. So they ask, okay, why are you, you're so far advanced than us, far, so much farther advanced than us? What are you doing looking at us? Mm-hmm. They're like, well, you know, you, you we came from you or something like you, and so when we study you, we're it's almost like we're studying ourselves. And they again, they never bring up that this is a proto-Vulcan society, so. Are Vulcans are is it are we now assuming that Vulcans are not very different from humans or was that just sort of a, a throw in line of why we study 
past civilizations. I, I mean, that yeah, that, that's more how I took it. But you're right. Like, it could easily have been, you know, him just being wrong, I guess. I mean, are there proto-human civilizations out there that people are watching, too? I, I'm, ass- I'm going to assume so. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're watching them. I, but they're, I also wonder how long they're going to watch them. You know, because, like, we it took us millennia to get from the Bronze Age to space travel. And we're watching this culture right. yeah. at the Bronze Age with a station. Like, we, you know, we're, we're planning on being there for a while. But, you know, how, how long is a while? Like, do we watch for 10 years? Do we watch the growth in real time? I suppose it, it kind of implies that there are so many planets out there with, with civilizations at different stages of development mm-hmm. that they can just leapfrog between um, all of those and get a good sense of right? them. Right? No, that's probably that could what it be is, yeah. sort of what the yeah, study yeah. is. And so... I wouldn't normally bring this up, but it seems to be germane to this conversation. So there's a Voyager episode where Voyager gets trapped in the orbit of a planet that is, it's time because of some mumbo jumbo, Mm -hmm. it's time is moving much faster than, than the outside of space. And so they get to do this same experiment from orbit where we, they literally get to watch civilization advance. I think it's called blink of an eye, the name of the, of the Voyager episode. Okay. And I think that might be my favorite Voyager episode mm. because it, it, it is such an interesting way to that a great version of science fiction where you get to do what they're doing in this episode of who watches the watchers, but on a huge scale mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, and they, they kind of do a good job explaining that and, and demonstrating that. And even the doctor goes down and is there for years and years, but in, in reality he's on the, in ship time, he's only gone for a couple of seconds. Right. And, uh, it's just so much fun. I just I love that episode because it's a great uh, macrocosm, if that's a word, of this episode. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, but we'll get right. to it. Okay. So yeah. So we're both at definite genuine Star Trek episode, right? Yes. Yeah. G- proper Pro- proper yeah. Star Trek episode. Good Star Trek episode. Yep. Yeah. All right. So should we see what we're watching next? Let's do it. Okay. Voyager. Star Trek. Blink of an eye. Sorry. Star Trek. Voyager. <laughs> what would you think are the odds? <laughs> Season 6, episode 25, The Haunting of Deck 12. It's funny that we talked about this being that this Who Watches the Watchers feeling like a horror episode. I think this is an actual horror episode. Right. All right. And the blurb says... Neelix becomes extremely agitated as Voyager begins a full shutdown before entering a peculiar astronomical nebula. Actually, what it sounds like is Doctor's Orders. Yeah, it does. I guess every show has one of these after Next Gen where they have to lock the ship down and somebody has to stay awake for whatever reason. Is that what this is? Is that what this is going to turn into? Well, that's, yeah, that, I mean, that's kind of what it sounds like. Um, begins a full shutdown before entering. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I don't know if everybody goes into, you know, a sleep state um, or. Or what? But only one way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's try and figure it out now, shall we? Oh, yeah. Is this our medical minute? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Could, could go either way, really. All right, let's go watch okay. it. Okay. 